Welcome to the Interlocutor Podcast. I'm Tyrell Cameron Eskelson. My guest today is Jeffrey Kramer. As a student, Jeffrey studied English literature, which led him to become a professional librarian in 1978. He's best known for his expertise on Henry David Thoreau, as a scholar and editor of many editions of Thoreau's work. He's curator of collections at the Walden Woods Project, which is part of the Thoreau Institute at Walden Woods. Today, he joins me for a discussion about the life and times of Henry David Thoreau and why he's still read and remembered today. Jeffrey Kramer, thank you very much for joining me. It's a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you for having me. So Henry David Thoreau was born in 1817 and died in 1862. Correct. Uh, Since the time of his death, has he been popular and read uh, throughout that entire time? Or or have there been uh, periods of popularity and and decline in in his uh, readership throughout the decades? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Strangely enough, even though we think of him as such an American icon of literature, um, he wasn't really read for about the first hundred years after he died. Um, So he was a pretty small footnote in the history of American literature. particularly in relation to Emerson and transcendentalism, it wasn't until the really the 1960s, starting the 1950s, but really the 1960s when he came into his own. Um, the back to the land culture, the hippies, um, the counterculture, the idea of civil disobedience, all of those things kind of brought him to the fore in the 1960s. And then as we progressed to be more interested in the natural world, a lot of his writings about nature have um, become a focus. So um, since the 1960s, he's been steadily um, read more and more. Mm-hmm. Well, so uh, around the time of Rachel Carlson and Silent Spring, uh, sort of yep. kick started Ex- the environmental movement. Things exactly. Like that. Yes. Okay. Uh, in, in your background, you, you began... Uh, your career as a, a scholar and academic interested in English literature. Mm-hmm. How far back did that interest develop in your life? <laughs> Strangely, since I was a a small person, a young young child, um, I have mm-hmm. always loved books and literature and reading, and um, was definitely um, what I guess would be labeled now as a nerd. Um, I loved academic books with lots of footnotes in the back or at the bottom of the page. Um, so it's something that has always interested me since I was very, very young and developed, um, kept my interest in that going as sort of independent from all of my schoolwork. So um, I would say certainly since a teenager, um, I've been writing about various authors I've loved and thinking about them a lot and studying them. Um, Thoreau came a bit later in my um, career. Mm-hmm. And what town or city did you grow up in? I grew up in Massachusetts, a town called Medford, um, and then later yeah. on moved around a little bit. Um, but basically, I've been born and bred in Massachusetts and spent my whole life here. Home of Paul Thoreau, right? Of, of yeah, he he was. I can't remember where, Isn't where he, he from came from. Medford, Massachusetts. He might have been. He I, might have been. Yeah, I think yeah. he was. Yeah, yeah. Which uh, is another French name, but I think that name comes pronounced from, differently. Yeah, yeah, from Quebec area, whereas Thoreau was from the New Jersey area. Is that right? Mm-hmm. That that name comes oh, oh. from that area. Yep, New Jersey, England. I mean, yeah. All right, yeah. and what? What were the influences or interests that led you to choose uh, getting a certification in uh, being a librarian? What made you want yeah. to pursue that as a career? Um, because when I was younger, I was extremely painfully shy, um, very introverted. And so the idea of doing something with books where I might have to interact with people um, just seemed something I could not or did not want to do. Um, so the idea of teaching was not something at that time I thought I could in any way do. Even having a, a bookstore um, seemed like, well, you have to interact with the customers and, and things like that. So 
when I first became a librarian, I was planning on living, doing, doing that work behind the scenes, cataloging and curating and doing those things. Um, over time, my career in library work um, went more public. And so I developed an ability to talk to people and to work with the public. So it changed um, over time. But librarianship at the time was really just my way to make money, to, to pay the rent, to put mm -hmm. food on the table. Mm. And so uh, now public speaking and interacting with visitors to Walden area is a big part of your job. Uh, it's it is. Public speaking, did you just discover that, uh, develop confidence and realize that you you'd have an ability in this? Or was it something that you worked on and, and practiced? Yeah, it, it was just um, over time. So I mean, the first couple of times I spoke in public, I was a complete wreck. I mean, it just, you know, <laughs> very, very nervous. Um, had to read from my papers. I, I couldn't even like speak off the cuff. Um, but I developed at some point a confidence that I knew my subject well enough that I could speak off the cuff and not have to and just read from a paper um, and felt I had a knack for it. Um, the audience interacted nicely with what I had to say. They laughed when I made a joke. They were quiet when I said something serious. So it sort of developed to a point where I realized I, I can do this. Um, mm -hmm. And actually, um, and still an introvert, um, and, but I actually enjoy this performance part of my career. Um, although I do have to say as an introvert and any introvert out there listening will understand this, um, you do this and it is extremely exhausting. Um, and so after this is over, I'll probably go and have a bit of a rest. <laughs> I understand completely. <laughs> uh, that describes me to a, a T, I would say <laughs> that I'm introverted as well. And when I, teach at the university after a, a 90 minute lecture usually i'm exhausted from yeah. the interaction in, in mm -hmm. public so i like to, i spend a lot of time in this uh, cozy little room here with books as well nice <laughs> yeah. so uh, i'm interested in setting some background uh for the life and times of of henry david thoreau starting with concord what what kind of town was Concord in the first half of the 19th century, the 1820s to the 1850s? And how did it come to have such a prominent group of writers who most yeah. of them re relocated there? Correct. So, I mean, it was a small town, um, um, but well-to-do. Um, and it... Had I mean, Thoreau was born there, basically. So Thoreau grew up in Concord. This is his town. Emerson had family in Concord, his um, and, and had been there many times. So when he he had been married, he lived in Boston. He was a minister, and when his first wife died from tuberculosis, he inherited some money. And so when he got married for the second time, he was able to afford to move to Concord, a town that he was familiar with. Um, and then once Emerson was there, who was pretty much the center of transcendental um, writing, um, people came to Concord to be around Emerson. So the Alcotts had moved there. Um, Hawthorne had moved there, not because of Emerson, but but they were there. Um, Margaret Fuller would visit often. So you had this group of people who, whether they lived in Concord or did not, still came to Concord and congregated around Emerson. Um, so that he was pretty much the center. Thoreau at that time was pretty unknown, um, not necessarily well respected, and um, but Emerson took him under his wing and sort of mentored him and uh, brought him into that circle of, of amazing writers and people. Mm -hmm. And what was the circumstances for them meeting and why... Why was Thoreau attracted to the writings or philosophy of Emerson? And what did Emerson mm -hmm. see in Thoreau that made him want to take on not only the mentorship role, but they also developed a, a friendship, friendship uh, that yeah. lasted through their entire lives? Correct. Yeah. Um, so Thoreau had read some Emerson when he was at Harvard. 
um, Emerson's first book, Nature, had come out. And Thoreau was pretty blown away by the power um, and the ideas in Emerson's book, um, to the point that he took it out of the Harvard Library twice. And he also gave it as a gift to a friend. And Thoreau was not a person with much money. So the fact that he would buy this book to give it to somebody shows that he had this love and respect for this book um, to a great um, amount. Um, and he would, of course, known of Emerson. Um, when Emerson moved to Concord, people knew who Emerson was. Um, mm -hmm. The stories vary a little bit about how they actually met, but the most prominent one seems to be um, that Thoreau had a crush on Emerson's sister-in-law and wrote her a poem that he tied up with a bunch of violets and threw them through the window of Emerson's home. Um, but and then variants of that appear where people have read Thoreau's writings um, and would say to Emerson, you know, you should meet this guy, you should know this guy, his, his ideas are very similar to yours. So one way or another, they did actually meet. Um, and Emerson did see something in him. Um, and I think what he probably saw was somebody who had very similar, but slightly different ideas than he did. So somebody he could mentor, somebody he could help, but somebody he could also bounce ideas off of. So very early in their relationship, um, Thoreau is living at the Emerson house, um, ostensibly to be Emerson's handyman to help around the house, but also to help with his writings, to help with editing his works that are being published and things like that. And what I discovered um, when I researched their friendship a lot was that there are <laughs> things that are in some very, fairly early Emerson essays, like Self-Reliance, you know, one of the seminal Emersonian pieces that have lines in it that Thoreau wrote, that Thoreau told him in conversation. And the, we know this because they would appear in their journals um, and that Thoreau might say something and Emerson would absorb that and put it in his essay. Um, it's not always attributed. And um, in those days, people didn't always attribute things the way we would today. Um, you're honoring a person by using their, their words, their writing. Um, it, it was something that was, um, you know, sort of accepted as the way things were done. So um, it, it was wonderful to see that sort of exchange um, intellectually um, between them both um, at such an early point in their relationship. Mm -hmm. Could you say a, a few words about what transcendentalism was as a, a philosophy and movement and yeah. whether the people who are identified with that, did they identify themselves with that term? Yeah. I mean, originally it was somewhat of a derogatory term. It wasn't, um, <clears throat> when, when that term was sort of thrown up against them, it wasn't necessarily in the nicest way, but like many groups mm -hmm. where you have a term that's somewhat derogatory, you sometimes take it onto yourselves and give it a new meaning, give it a new, and to wear it proudly. Um, so the, in fact, the group of transcendentalists or who we think of as the group of transcendentalists were never a cohesive group. Um, it was always um, more like a group of like-minded individuals, men and women who met occasionally and had very similar ideas, um, but never quite the same ideas um, and never quite a, a formed group of people. Um, Transcendentalism in itself, um, as a concept, um, is the way I like to explain it is um, we experience certain things in our lives, experiential learning. But we also in, intuit truth um, directly from God. And the idea is that um, we know innately what, you know, good from, good from bad, right from wrong, um, and we get that truth directly from God. And so we intuit a truth that transcends basically our day-to-day -day experiences. Um, and that is the transcendental truth. So that is why the transcendentalists believed, um, one, in a direct relationship to God. Um, you didn't need a minister. You didn't need ways of approaching God, you as an individual could have a relationship with God. 
Um, but it's also why the spirituality of how they lived was so important. Why, um, for instance, somebody like Thoreau experienced God in nature um, rather than in church because he was having a direct experience. Um, and it's why they believed that the truths that they inherited or in, in, um, got directly from God were greater than any man-made laws so that you had higher laws than the man-made laws that, of the land. Um, and because of that, um, it, um, I'm sorry, because of that, um, they felt themselves not above the law. I don't want to put it in that way, but they felt that there were certain things in issues of slavery, for instance, where the ideas that they felt about good and, and bad, um, transcended whatever the laws of the land said. So yes, it may have been legal to enslave a person in, in certain states in this country, but that does not make it right. And, and that you would fight against that wrong because regardless of the, what the laws of the land say, you have to fight against that. Hmm. That uh, is a, a good segue to the essay, Civil Disobedience. Uh, I, yeah. guess, I guess we could bring that, that one up now. Sure. I, this was one of uh, Thoreau's works that I wrestle with a lot and, and I find once I start getting into this idea of civil disobedience and trying to separate morality and say partisanship under a constitution mm -hmm. to the degree that those things can be separated, I feel like an entire political philosophy course could be designed <laughs> around just exploring these ideas. Yeah. And I, I think the Thoreauvian principle that if, if something is morally wrong, then uh, if the state does something morally wrong, then you acting against that is by principle right, which uh, mm -hmm. was what he had to say about the night he spent in jail. Right. But where it starts to get, I think, a little difficult, say, in an American context is if something is deemed constitutional and uh, you're just making an interpretation on the the trade-offs between this policy and this policy, it gets uh, it becomes really difficult whether one should be civilly disobedient or not in that situation. So, how how much responsibility is there for on the individual for their subjective understanding of these things? Yeah, it's you know when I first started talking about Thoreau 20 odd years ago, more than 20 years ago. Um, and when I would teach the idea of civil disobedience, it was a pretty simple concept um, because it seems so obvious. And now it, it's become a much harder concept because the, well, first thing, when you look at Thoreau in his day, or the idea of civil disobedience. First of all, civil disobedience has nothing to do with passivity. So it's not the idea of being civil, it's the idea of just being disobedient to civil law, um, which, is, which is a common sort of misunderstanding about it. But, um, but in Thoreau's day, if you wanted to fight against an injustice as an individual, or even a small group of people, the amount of damage you could cause is pretty minimal um, if you think about it. We now live in an age where an individual can bring down a building, can fly a plane into a building, can do so much incredible damage in, and they are doing it for what they think are the right reasons. And mm. so it becomes a very difficult philosophical argument to say, you know, it's, you, you can be disobedient here because that's for good, but you can't be disobedient in this way because that's not for good, but the people who are doing it think they're doing it for good. So it becomes very, very complicated, not an easy sort of black and white kind of issue where you can say, this is absolutely right. Um, Thoreau felt, um, he was very pantheistic in how he looked at religion and, and, and things so that he felt that all 
religions um, if you looked at their sacred texts and ignored the formal church of whatever religion we're speaking about. But if you looked at the religious text, they seem to come down to that sense of uh, the golden rule, the idea that um, you do not want to harm other people, that you want to be treated or you want to treat other people the same way that you want to be treated. And in theory, that philosophy, which I think is part of the idea of civil disobedience, is that if we all open our heart, soul, mind, whatever you want to say, to the idea that God tells us what is right or wrong, and that we intuit this kind of truth, um, and that we have to treat people like we want to be treated, if you, figure, if you look at it that way, then obviously if your neighbor is in trouble, you want to help them. If they don't have enough clothing to get through winter, you, you give them clothing. If they don't have enough food, you give them food to help them through. You do what you can to support them in any way you can, because that's what you do to your neighbor. Um, and in this global world we live in, we're all neighbors. So if you carry Thoreau's philosophy of, of it to a certain degree, well, Obviously, if we did all those things, if we helped our neighbors always, we took care of other people, we would never have war. You couldn't harm somebody, you couldn't murder somebody, you couldn't kill somebody in a war, you couldn't do all the things that we do in this world we live in. Um, and, and even if you think you're doing it for the sake of right or goodness. Um, but sadly, we know that that's never going to happen. I mean, we sadly know now, uh, maybe we're just a world of cynics or realists or whatever you want to call us, we know that those ideas don't always work anymore. Um, and so it's a really, really difficult question or, or, or philosophy. Um, you know, what is civil disobedience? When you disobey something, when you break a law, when are you doing it? Why are you doing it? And what are you doing it for? And what is the purpose of it? Um, so it's, it's a very, very difficult topic these days. Mm -hmm. And was this essay one of the, you spoke earlier about how Thoreau's writings became, uh, there was a resurgence in people reading them in the 1960s, was civil disobedience and the counterculture at that time part, part of the reason why people were reading yeah, him? Yeah, I mean, we're talking about the, a war in Vietnam. Um, where so many college students, I mean, a lot of people around the world, of course, were against this war, but particularly the, the college students were, were fighting in any way they could to end this war in Vietnam. And I would be surprised if most of those students did not have a copy of Civil Disobedience in their backpack or had just read it because it's so in line with what they were doing or trying to do. And it's so in line with what Thoreau says you have to do. Um, mm -hmm. So when you think about the law, the legality, um, and you think about war, but you think about students who are breaking the law by burning their draft card and saying, you know, I don't care if that is the law that says I can be drafted, I can become a soldier, and I can go kill people. That is wrong. I am not going to go. So you start having this groundswell of people who are objecting to what's going on. And they're doing it in um, the, the ways that Thoreau sort of prescribes in civil disobedience. And in Thoreau's time in 46, 47, 48, there was the American war with Mexico that he, he was writing about <laughs> at that time, right? Right, yeah. yeah. I mean, in that, and part of the war with Mexico, um, aside from the fact that we were sort of invading um, this, this territory. Um, but part of it was dependent, it made a big difference in how this huge mass of land, this territory would come into the United States and how it would be broken up and what it would mean in relation to the um, slaveholding states. So if all of this territory came in to the U.S. and they became slaveholding states that were, you know, where you could legally enslave people, um, that would create a huge imbalance in the country um, and could have, in essence, allowed for slavery to become 
uh, sort of the more the dominant than it was. Um, but so that was one of the reasons Thoreau would be fighting against or, or protesting against this, this war with Mexico. Um, hmm. Everything sort of boiled down to that issue of slavery. Right. And maybe we could say a, a few more words about what was going on uh, in both his state and in in the north and and in America as well, because that had some influence on what he was writing about as well. So yeah. there's the uh, both growing economy and growing mm -hmm. demographics as well. Uh, this the expansion west, opening up all the Louisiana territory and settling that from the early 1800s to the mm -hmm. uh, uh, antebellum period. Uh, other things like the digging the Erie Canal and the Ohio Canal and, and developing shipping and, and uh, factories are starting to, yep. little factories are starting to get dot the New England landscape and little riverside towns. So yeah. How, how did these changes uh, impact what Thoreau was seeing and thinking about and writing about? Um, well, in a couple of ways. And, and just one of the other things I want to mention that was happening that particularly riled up Thoreau was the Fugitive Slave Act, which um, mm. pretty much made it incumbent upon free states to use their power, their militia, their, their police to... Um, search for and capture escaped enslaved persons. So that law made it so that if a person had made it from an enslaved state to freedom in Massachusetts, say, um, Massachusetts had to um, capture them and send them back. So all of a sudden, you know, Northern abolitionists are looking at, you know, not only are we in a free state, but all of a sudden, we are having to capture these people and send them back to their, their horrible lives. Um, and that really became a turning point in how I think Northerners started to look at things, um, as well as you had John Brown coming to try to raise money for the things he was trying to do. Um, not that he told people necessarily <laughs> what he was doing, but that became a big impetus. Um, so when, if we can just do a little bit more background, when, when Thoreau yeah. was arrested for, you know, non-payment of taxes because he was doing a personal protest against slavery and against how his money might be used um, when he was taxed, um, Emerson's reaction to that was, um, he, he, he said to Alcott, it was mean and skulking. Like, you, you don't go and get yourself arrested. This is not what you do. Um, but when Thoreau got out of jail and eventually spoke with Emerson, they had this incredible discussion in Emerson's study. And what came of this discussion was Emerson's realization that what Thoreau did was the right thing, what Thoreau did was a good and moral thing, and what Thoreau did was not going far enough. And so Emerson looked at the larger issue and was saying that, you know, it's not just the slave states, it's us. We have to look at how guilty we are for being part of this. We are drinking the rum that is, you know, coming from slave plantations. We own the ships that are bringing people back and forth from Africa. Um, we are wearing the cotton that has been made from cotton picked by slaves. We are contributing to um, this horrible um, state of affairs by not looking closely at our own actions. And that was an amazing thing. And that was an amazing thing for someone to think about in the 1840s and 1850s. Um, mm -hmm. And I love that because you know, so often, and I include myself in this, we are so ignorant of how we contribute to the ills of the world. And, um, you know, I, when I talk to a lot of students, um, we talk about um, 
like signing a change.org petition to save the world. And, you know, you see this petition about whatever, and, oh, this is a horrible thing. Let me click on it. And then you feel like you've done your, your bed and you can pat yourself on the back and you can go away. Um, but I talked to them, you know, I say, you know, if there was a change.org petition that said, you know, we want to stop the factories in, let's say, China, where they're using child labor and the conditions are horrible, um, you know, you would sign that in a second. But I said, I guarantee you almost everybody in this room is wearing something made in one of those factories. Um, because when it comes to something that might be made in a more upstanding, legitimate factory where a t-shirt might cost you, let's say $25 or 30 so that the everybody's getting a really good wage for what they're doing. I said, are you gonna buy one t-shirt for 30, $35? Or are you gonna buy four t-shirts that are like, you know, $10 each, you know, but those aren't made well. Uh, or made by, you know, good standards. Um, and so trying to wake people up to our implicitness in this. Um, and and that becomes sort of eye-opening um, when students realize that um, they are, you know, it's nice to say I'm against this, but you need to do things. Um, you know, we, we have all read um, stories and re read news articles and conditions in like an Amazon um, warehouse um, where they don't let, um, you know, women use, you know, the bathroom to take care of things that they need to take care of. They don't let, you know, mothers or, or pregnant women do the things they need to do to take care of their bodies. They just, they are not allowed and they're, it's documented. And yet everybody will buy something from Amazon to save five cents. Um, hmm. And nobody will fight against these things because it's going to be an imposition to themselves. Um, and I, and I definitely include myself in that. I am not like preaching like, oh, this is what we should all do. And um, I am far from perfect. But I know that it does help to at least be conscious of these things and to, in the little ways we can, one, one way or another, try to fight against these things because they're so overwhelming and they're so everywhere. Um, so um, this is that one of the things I get from Thoreau is that idea mm -hmm. of being deliberate in our choices, being awake to the things that are happening around us. And I think part of that came from Emerson's awareness of how Thoreau had this idea, but really could, could take it a lot further. Mm. That's well said. Good. Uh, Thoreau had a, a brother and the two of them, at a when they were young adults they set out they built their own boat and set off on the would Concord they have started Rivers. at that fork in the road where the concord forks into the i, I forget the names of, of what the, it forks the into there's the concord the merrimack and the Assabet rivers um Assabet, they did it right. from the boat yeah they did it from the boat landing one of the boat landings in concord uh, near concord uh -huh. center um and then went from there um, and, and he describes how the 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 flow of the river is really gentle. That if there's a, only an eighth of an inch change like in the that. gradient over a mile, that you'll get a flow. But they were able yep. to go against that because it was so gentle. So gentle, yeah. yeah, yeah. And that was that was a wonderful excursion for them. They were very very close brothers, um, so it was nice that they got to do this journey together. Um, and it inspired Thoreau's first book, um, A Week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers, um, in part because John had died. Um, and mm -hmm. Thoreau was looking for a way to memorialize John, to think about John, and decided to write this book about that boat trip they had taken together. Um, and so much comes of this, as in the, John's death, that it created the so the impetus for Thoreau to want to write um, his first book. But he also, Thoreau also needed a place where he could write. So the Thoreau family home where he wrote took in boarders. So it was, a, it was a busy household, noisy household. His friend Emerson's house was also a busy, noisy household. So he needed a place of peace and quiet where he could write his first book. Emerson had just purchased some woodlots at Walden Pond and Thoreau got permission from Emerson to build a house there so he could write his book. Um, and that became so much, you know, it becomes something 
greater. So he goes now to Walden Pond to write a week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers, which he did write drafts of while he was there. But while he's there, people are saying to him, you know, Henry, what are you doing? Like, why are you out there? Um, Walden Woods was marginal land. It wasn't good for anything. It wasn't good for farming. It was only good for growing wood, um, <clears throat> excuse me, to fuel your home. And the people who lived there, the people who had lived in the woods or did live in the woods, were people who weren't really welcome in Concord society. You had um, the Irish who had come over to build the railroad. We're not really welcome in Concord society. Um, it's where freed and slave people had lived. It's where um, alcoholics lived. It is where um, people they call lurkers. I love that word, lurkers. Um, <laughs> it's where the lurkers lived. Um, so it was not a place where a white middle-class son of a businessman, Harvard graduate, former teacher goes to live. So people are saying, you know, what are you doing out there, Henry? And that developed into a lecture called A History of Myself, which became the book Walden. Um, mm -hmm. So John's death um, actually sort of brought things to a place where they may never have happened if John hadn't died which is not to say that one is happy that John died, but it is saying that it's interesting sometimes to look at all the things that happened in the future or because of one, one thing that does happen. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. What, what do you think it is the significance of how Thoreau wrote that book, uh, the Merrimack River one? The, their trip was two weeks, and he decided Correct. to condense it down into one week. And yep. What do you think uh, he, what, what was uh, leading to those yeah. decisions as a writer? Why was he making those choices? Yeah. So in part, and he does the same thing in Walden. He says it with almost all of his books that they are, he condenses larger periods of time into smaller periods of time. One, to have control over the narrative, mm -hmm. but also because he's not writing an autobiography. He's not writing a memoir. Um, and this is something that, I think is confusing for people because he writes in such a deeply personal way that people assume that he's talking about something that actually happened or happened in that way. And he's, he's has a narrative going the persona um, or the, the narrator in each work in a week on the Concord of Merrimack rivers, but even more in Walden is not necessarily the Henry David Thoreau who walked around Concord. Um, he's trying to tell a very particular story um, and needs to adjust the narrative to make that happen. Um, there are passages where when you look at manuscripts, you know that this this passage was at one point in A Week on the Concord of Merrimack Rivers, which he's writing at the same time as Walden, and he moves it from one manuscript to the other. Where does it fit? Where does it actually flow with the proper narrative I'm trying to tell? Um, and if you think about it, at the, in the two years that he lived at Walden Pond, he wrote drafts of A Week on the Concord of Merrimack River, Rivers. He wrote drafts of Walden. He wrote the essay Katahdin, which is an amazing essay about climbing Mount Katahdin in the Maine woods. And likely, um, although we don't know for sure, there must be some kind of drafts of civil disobedience. He at least has to be thinking about it. Um, and those are four very different narratives that he's writing at the same time. So he's he's a very, um, as a writer, he's very deliberate and thoughtful about what he's trying to do. But because of that, we read it as if we're, you know, he is telling us what he did every day of his life or, or in these, these instances. So condensing a week or condensing parts of Walden um, for him makes sense because he's trying to tell you something about a particular idea. But in the reality of his life, um, it's different from what he experienced. Um, you know, when you read um, A Week on the Concord of Merrimack Rivers, for instance, most of that book, you would never know he has a companion. Um, you would certainly not know that it's his brother, John. Um, you know, so unless you know the background of the book, you wouldn't know any of this. And, and that's fine because it's not necessary to what he's telling you in how he describes the river and how he describes the historical things that happened along this river. Um, that's not important. Um, 
in the same way there are things that happened while he was at Walden that are not in the book Walden. Um, then there are lots of things that are in the book Walden that never happened at Walden or didn't happen while he was living there. Um, he's a writer and people I think tend to forget that about him. Um, you know, when you go into a room with a bunch of people and you just say, tell me who Thor was, you're going to get, oh, he's that hermit or he's the transcendentalist or <laughs> he's the civil disobedient, but not as many people will say, oh, he was that writer. Um, Cause you forget. And that's that's what you're chiefly interested in when it comes to Thoreau is the fact that he was a writer. You're interested in his writing. I even once heard you say you not wouldn't be all that interested to meet him. What you're <laughs> interested in is what he was trying to say through his writing. I, I have a yes. couple of questions uh, based sure. on uh, how you approach uh, studying him. Uh, I'm just going to see where I got them written down here. Uh, well, I can't find it there. I'll just uh, say it from the top of my head. Thoreau, in one of his works, he talks about public speaking and not wanting to get too comfortable on a lecture circuit, maybe, or something like that. And I'm interested to know, uh, something like storytelling, mythology, oral history, these things are as ancient as humanity. Yet for Thoreau, though, it was it was all about the writing. Why didn't he see public speaking, which he was very good at, mm -hmm. as connected to writing and, and a way of uh, further connecting with the people who would be his readers? Why yeah. was it more about the writing for him and not public speaking? Yeah. I mean, I think he used the public speaking as a way to test out his writing. So, um, for instance, in the writing process, um, he would gather things from his journal, glean things from his journal that would become a lecture that he could sort of test out on an audience um, mm -hmm. before it became a, an essay. But I think he didn't like the public speaking part of it. I don't think he liked the interaction with people as much. Um, and it was, I think, more of a chore. At the same time, um, he took it seriously. This is what writers did. This is how you got an audience. This is literally how you made some money doing it. Um, and I came across this, we had purchased a manuscript a while ago. And on the back of one of the manuscript leaves, he is talking about um, giving a lecture. And, and I believe it was his lectures on, on Moonlight, but he, he talks about, wouldn't it be wonderful if I could set up the podium in just such a way that we could turn up, we'd have no lights on, so blow out all the candles and have the light stream through the window and hit my page and I could read from the light of the moon and wouldn't that be dramatic? So <laughs> despite the fact that he didn't love lecturing, he would rather write books than lecture and he was clear about that, he still took it to a level that is quite amazing. And he's seeing that whole production level of life. So I'm not just getting up and reading this thing. There's a production to it. And, and he was very funny. I mean, there are, there are reviews of lectures, same as you have reviews of any entertainment in those days. And, and people were literally falling in the aisles laughing because he could be so funny. And mm -hmm. people miss that about him. I mean, I would love to have been able to somehow jump back in time and watch him lecture, because I think it would be fascinating to see how he presents certain lines. Um, you know, we um, tend to deepen our voices when we read these iconic authors, you know, and I went to the woods to live deliberately and do it, <laughs> but we miss so much in them um, by not letting our, our brains sort of just open up to the possibilities of the humor and the puns and the all the inside jokes that are going on in his writing. So, um, but overall, I mean, it was clear that he would rather sit in his study or his room and write a book than have to go out and lecture. It's definitely true. One of the things I identified with a lot, I recently uh, was did this writing project. Uh, I was writing a book about Taiwan and there were mm -hmm. several months where I was preparing to go there and do field work and research there. And 
on a daily basis, I was writing just some thought in my in a journal and keep <laughs> keeping thoughts in a journal. Whatever occurred to me, it was uh, I, I guess a, a creative process and. A lot of it doesn't get used. Some of it does, mm -hmm. or some of it germinates into something else. When I, I in this uh, one of your uh, editions of Thoreau, called mm -hmm. the Portable Thoreau, you have some selections from Thoreau's journal. Right. When I read the th things that he puts in his journal, I thought, oh, that that seems like exactly how I was preparing to do my writing. And I, mm -hmm. I picked one out from here that I like to uh, say a couple uh, read a couple sure. sentences and have you uh, maybe riff on it what it says about Thoreau mm -hmm. as a writer he says that a well built sentence in the rapidity and force with which it works may be compared to a modern day to a modern corn planter which furrows out drops the seed and covers it up in one moment the scholar requires hard labor as an impetus to his pen he will learn to grasp it as firmly and wield it as gracefully and effectually as an axe or a sword. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, what is he saying about his writing process there? He's, he's clearly, to me, talking about the difficulty that any of us, any, anyone out there who's written um, knows, you know, it doesn't, you don't sit down and write. It doesn't always flow. Um, and there are places in his journals where he is testing out lines and then it, that same line appears slightly different two pages later three pages later um mm -hmm. there's one point where the very famous different drummer quotation that's probably one of his more famous quotations and was on every poster in the 1960s um i was trying to trace this quotation back to see like where where did it germinate where did it start and i found that he's writing this over like five or six years I mean, not five or six weeks or days or months. It's like five or six years where he has this idea and you see the idea and he tries it out and he tries it out for a couple of months, different ways and lets it sit. And then about two years later, it pops up again. He's trying it again and again and again, and he's getting it closer and closer and closer. And it's like, you know, it's like somebody with a chisel, like a, a sculptor, and he is getting closer. Let's break off this part. Let's smooth out this part. Um, and then uh, miraculously, he doesn't get it perfect, doesn't get it just right until it's already the publisher and he's doing the final cleanup of the, of the editor of the manuscript um, with the publisher. But it is clearly um, a task. It is a job. It is something that is not simple. And I mean, one of the things that first attracted me to Thoreau was, was not what he had to say, it was how he said it. Um, and I remember the first time I was reading Thoreau's writings back in college and not part of my college work, I was doing it separately because um, a friend said I should read this guy Thoreau. I picked up an anthology and, and I really wasn't blown away by what he was saying yet, but I was absolutely mesmerized by the beauty of how he put words and sentences together. I mean, this was just genius. Um, and so, you know, having studied him so long, you, you see the efforts that he put into um, his writing um, and trying to get each word and line to be the right word and the right line. And, you know, there are places where it doesn't happen. He is human and, and not every single word he ever wrote was perfect. And not every sentence he wrote was perfect. And a couple of essays aren't even perfect. Um, but Overall, you see the length he went to to try to make it the best he could possibly make it. Could Thoreau, uh, he mentions in Walden that uh, Homer is not yet translated into English. So was he a, a, a reader of Greek? He, he was, but he also yeah. talked about... Um, I mean, I think what he also meant was that you couldn't get the the true essence of a Greek text um, or has yet, we haven't quite captured it yet in English. I mean, it was already written in English. There are already translations in English. So um, mm. including Pope's Homer, which he had at Walden with him and Chapman's Homer years before. 
but I think he's talking about the the the, the essence of the words um, it are hard to translate, um, and that whenever you're translating, you're not getting the complete work, um, the complete ideas. Um, and I've worked with um, a lot of translators who are translating Walden, for instance, and the difficulty of translating someone like like Thoreau, I'm sure like any writer, but Thoreau in particular is that there are so many nuances and so many way, multiple meanings in, a, in the same sentence that as a translator, you can only do it one way. You can't say, they take sentence one and go, this is this, and this is this, this, and this, this, this. It's just like you can only do one sentence. So it's a great difficulty in getting it to be what that author originally intended it to be. Um, and I think that's what Thoreau's talking about there, um, is that you can't, it hasn't ever been translated, Homer has not been translated into English because you can't. You can never get um, something that will be exactly like Homer wrote, wrote it. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's helpful. I remember reading that that part from Walden, but I, I think it it makes sense hearing you explain mm -hmm. it in that way. It makes sense better, okay. and I can imagine it would be incredibly difficult to translate uh, Thoreau into another language. To yeah, I mean, what is fascinating when I sorry when I talk with translators right. is because they will send me questions as they're working on translating Walden. What does this mean? What, what did they mean by that? And they are things that when I read it in English, I don't even think about them. I just like zip on by. It's like, I think I know what it means. And all of a sudden when somebody's translating it into another language, they're looking at these words in ways I've never looked at them before. That's fascinating and also works in the context of the sentence or the paragraph. What they're asking about makes perfect sense. And yet, as an English speaking person, I would never have seen that because I'm just reading it so quickly in, 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 in a different way. So working with translators mm -hmm. has been really an eye-opening experience. And maybe we can continue on this theme a, a little bit more. Mm -hmm. In at the beginning of Walden, he starts with the chapter title or heading economy. economy. Right. Which not economics, it's economy, and if we trace that back to its ancient Greek word, it's it it means an economy of household, I believe. Mm -hmm. So, is there yeah. significance in the fact that he chose that particular word rather than economics, or do, does he mean yeah. the economy of household when he's using that? Yeah, the, I mean, basically, how to what what like back in when I was younger and they taught home economics in, you know, it's that kind of economy that how to right. run a household, how to live your life. And, and Walden as a book is really all about how to live your life, how to conduct your life. Um, and so that, I think that economy sense of it um, makes a lot of sense. Um, what I, the, the bad part about the economy chapter, um, which is a, which is a wonderful chapter is that it is a killer for most people. It, it's a mm. really hard chapter to get through. And, and I find that so many people can never make it through economy. And so they don't make it through Walden. Um, and, and I wish, um, not that I would ever change what Thoreau did, but sometimes I recommend to people that they actually skip economy and start with chapter two, um, where I lived and what I lived for. And mm -hmm. at the end of the book, after conclusion, then read economy almost like an afterward and it will make so much more sense because it fits into everything else he's talked about. And, and it's a brilliant chapter, but it just is very difficult for somebody to get through at the beginning of this book. Mm. Yeah. That seems like a good suggestion because then you know, you're sending the reader to that, that quite alluring and attractive right. line that I went to the woods cause I wish to live deliberately. Live deliberately. Right. So this is one of the big uh, questions that I wanted to ask you, and I'll, I'll make this my second last question. Uh, the, when Thoreau says the, the term to live deliberately, could, could you explain uh, a little yeah. of how you read him using that term, what you think he means by it, and how how you understand living deliberately in, in your life yep. as well. Yeah. Um, basically, he means to be away. He talks about 
you know, Walden, he wants to wake up his neighbors and that most of us go through our life asleep. So the idea is that you want to be awake in your life and that when you do something, you want to be deliberate in it, as in you want to think about it. What, what does it mean? And so when I talk to students, I tell this story from his journal about when he wanted to buy a spyglass, a telescope, um, which would help with his nature studies. He'd see birds from a distance and he could look at things in the woods. And he could easily go buy this telescope. Um, I think it was about a dollar and a quarter, which I think was about a week's wages in his day, but he could buy this. But he thinks about it. And he thinks about not only what does it cost to buy it, this dollar and a quarter, but Thoreau was not a man who had a nine to five job. He worked when he needed money. So for Thoreau to have the dollar and a quarter, he had to go earn it. So what do I have to do to earn this dollar and a quarter? How much labor do I have to do? How much, what do I have to do? And in doing that, what am I giving up to spend that time doing that labor for a week to buy the telescope? And so after a while, he deliberated and thought about it and said, yes, I need this thing. He bought this and it was a very useful tool for the rest of his life. But that, the length of that deliberation, the length of the thinking about it um, is amazing and something that is so difficult in our very fast paced world. Um, you know, we want something, we go buy it if we can afford it or we don't buy it, but we don't think about it that often, which is why we all have closets full of things that we never use um, because we don't think about what does it mean? And we don't think about what does it mean, not only in relation to myself, but in relation to others. I remember we do these teacher seminars at the Walden Woods Project. And one year we're sitting around in our library talking about various things. And somehow we got onto the idea of organic strawberries. And, and I was saying, um, you know, about the idea of organic strawberries. And, you know, we debate a little bit about, well, should we get organic or not organic? And is it really healthier or is it not healthier for us to eat an organic strawberry? And should we pay the extra money to have that? And one of the teachers looked at me and said, this isn't about you, Jeff. I said, what are you talking about? She said, it's about the person who's picking your strawberries. And if you are buying a non-organic strawberry, it is heavily sprayed with pesticides and insecticides and herbicides. So you get that beautiful strawberry, but that person who's picking your strawberry is, is breathing it in. It's on their skin and absorbed through the skin into their bloodstream. It's on their clothing. And that person will have literally a shorter life expectancy, literally because of the work they're doing to pick you that strawberry. But if you buy an organic strawberry, that's not happening. It's done with more natural ways. And that person is not getting infected by all these chemicals that are being absorbed through their skin. So it's not about you and whether that strawberry is healthier for you. It's about that person picking your strawberry and whether it's healthier for them. And that was like a mind opening challenge because it's like, it's not even like the thinking about you. It's thinking about how your actions, whatever you're doing, how it goes out and out and out. Um, and so that sense of deliberation from Thoreau is something I fail at it a lot. I mean, it's like, I, I, I wish I could do it for every single action I ever do, but I don't, but I try to do it more often than I used to. And I try to do it more and more. And, and a lot of times those thoughts that come up with thinking about something have, you know, in my family, it's like, we're not going to do this. We are not going to do this because it has um, repercussions that um, I just don't want to participate with. I don't want to further them. Um, we, I mean, not to get an anti, I won't buy anything from Amazon. We don't buy anything from Amazon. It's just not going to ever, ever happen. Um, you know, there are, there are companies that are bad companies and we are just not going to support them. Um, there are bad ways of doing things. And so we, We'll work our best to not support those. Does the company care? No. You know, does Amazon care that I'm not buying something? No, they don't care at all that I'm not buying something. But it makes me feel a little better when I go to sleep at night. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you, you brought up the Walden Woods project. Could you yeah. talk about when that began and why it began, uh, what the Walden yeah. Woods project is, the Thoreau? institute is and uh yep. and uh how people are uh, interacting with with this uh preserved site and and uh yeah. institution that so it started 
about 30 odd years ago um, by the musician Don Henley from the group, the Eagles, mm -hmm. um, and who is, he's a bit of a news junkie and he had heard about some development that was happening around Walden Pond, near Walden Pond, about a office condo that was being developed. And he found out about it and was really upset about how that would affect the landscape. You would see this from Walden Pond. It would affect the traffic. It would affect the water. So it would affect so much, so many different things. Um, and so he formed, um, at the time, he did a walk for Walden Woods and a concert for Walden Woods to raise awareness um, and eventually to raise money so that they could actually buy the land from the developer and stop this development. And from that, uh, the Walden Woods project was created as a pretty much as a land conservation effort to protect as much land around Walden Woods or land significant to Thoreau um, from further development, whether that's through purchase, whether that's through conservation easements, working with the town, working with owners, whatever it is to protect the land. Um, but over time, that also developed into an education department where we have um, seminars for teachers so that they learn ways to bring Walden back into their classroom. And we have developed um, our library, which is um, the most comprehensive library of thorough related material anywhere in the world with over 60,000 documents and about 8,000 volumes. We have, when you put all of our collections together, which includes not only our collections, but the collections of the Thorough Society, the Ralph Waldo Emerson Society and the Margaret Fuller Society. Um, when you put all that together, we have about 95% of anything ever published anywhere in the world at any time in any language with Thoreau's name on it. So not just large academic works, but newspaper clippings from here and there and articles and artwork and music and whatever um, in popular culture, t-shirts and mugs and all sorts of things. Um, so um, it's a place where if you're doing serious study on Thoreau, you should be reaching out to us and working with our collections. Um, but to find out more, um, our website is www.walden.org, and you can read all about what's going on there, the programs, different things that have happened in our history, and um, you know things that we've added to the library and things like that. Great. And uh, with your work, uh, I mentioned the the portable throw earlier. You also are a biographer of the friendship between uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau. That yes. book is called Solid Seasons. Mm -hmm. If people are interested in, in purchasing uh, some of your work or keeping up to date with, with what you're doing at the Walden Woods Project or yep. uh, with your personal writing, where can they go to where else can they go to get this information and keep up to date? Yeah. With what so, I mean, as far as my, my work is concerned, they can go to my website, which is www.jeffreyscramer.com. Um, you can purchase my books through any local bookshop. <laughs> um, you can also purchase them through the Walden Witch Project if you would like a signed copy. Um, so there, there's many ways to, to get things and, and to support what I'm doing and to support what the Walden Witch Project is doing. Um, we also have a gift shop and we are, always happy for donations to support our cause. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I, I think it's great what you guys have done over the past few decades, okay. preserving that, that site. And uh, it's, it's great for American culture to keep that, that site and the, the memory of uh, uh, Henry David Thoreau alive. So, and uh, I thought your annotated works uh where you, you write in the margins and, and help the reader. That that really helps me reading Thoreau. And Thank I you. Still feel like I have a I, I'm I think I need to read him for the rest of my life to, to continue uh <laughs> trying to understand him. But mm -hmm. I, I really enjoy uh reading him and and yeah. your work has helped me do that. Thank so. you. Thank you. And thanks very much for, for joining me today. It was a pleasure to speak it's... with you. It's my pleasure. And thank you for such thoughtful questions. I really appreciated it.